Hi everyone. So today's video is going to discuss some of the most popular weight loss procedures. And this video is meant to give you some background information. Ultimately, the decision to pursue any sort of surgery or procedure is going to need to be made in conjunction with you and your healthcare professional. In this video, I'll be discussing two surgeries. So Ruin Y gastric bypass and um, sleeve gastrectomy. And then the third one I'm going to be discussing is an endoscopic procedure. So a procedure uh, that is done with a scope um, and it can be done by gastroenterologists such as myself where a balloon is placed into the stomach. And so there's no cutting, there's no surgery involved with that. When we talk about these procedures, we use BMI or body mass index to help us determine whether or not somebody is eligible for the procedure. And so that will help us determine, you know, whether the risks outweigh the benefits for doing certain surgeries like the Ruin Y. So let's talk about BMI for a second. BMI uses height and weight to estimate whether someone is underweight, normal weight or overweight, for example. It is widely used because it is reliable and easy to measure. It is a better estimate of total body fat than looking at body weight alone. It's not perfect and it definitely has its problems. For people who are very muscular like bodybuilders or professional athletes, it may overestimate the degree of fat on a person. It can also underestimate the degree of fat in older people since they lose muscle mass with aging. Then of course, the height of an older individual can change because of things like osteoporosis where they get shorter and then this can cause a higher BMI. The BMI classifications are meaningful because they allow us to estimate cardiovascular risk, basically determining whether somebody is at higher risk of high blood pressure, heart attacks, etc. So in terms of complications, well-established hazards um, have been linked to obesity, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer, osteoarthritis, liver disease, obstructive sleep apnea, depression, etc. For people who are within the BMI range of 25 to 35, it's also important to measure waist circumference, since the amount of fat that is on the abdomen can also impact cardiovascular risk. So waist circumference of greater than or equal to 102 centimeters for men and then um, 88 centimeters for women is considered elevated and indicative of increased cardiovascular risk. However, there's some information to suggest that the cutoffs should be lower for Asians, such as a waist circumference of 80 centimeters um, in Asian females and 90 centimeters in Asian males. So the idea is that Asians will experience increased risks of cardiovascular and metabolic complications at lower BMIs and waist circumferences. So why do some people need surgery? Well, Research suggests that lifestyle intervention will help with a two to 9% decrease in body fat. And for some individuals who may be 200 or 300 pounds overweight, this may not be enough for them to reverse some of the health complications that they may have experienced associated with the um, increase in their weight. So what are the benefits of bariatric surgery? Well, a recent study suggested that bariatric surgery may reduce the risk of cancer by as much as 50% in selected patients. This data was recently published in Gastroenterology, which is a well-respected scientific journal. In this study, the health data of 98,000 privately insured individuals who were, who were classified as severely obese with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from 2007 to 2017 was analyzed. 34% of these individuals had bariatric surgery. The study authors found that surgery decreased the risk of all types of cancers by 18%. Obesity related cancers decreased by 25%. Obesity related cancers include colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, endometrial cancer, thyroid and hepatocellular carcinoma, for example. Bariatric surgery may also prolong life as seen in this study from Israel. In this study, 8,300 patients were matched to 25,000 non-surgical patients. This means that these non-surgical matched patients were chosen to have the same characteristics as the individuals who had surgery, basically trying to allow us to better see the effect of surgery. At four point three years, there were 105 deaths in the surgery group versus 583 deaths in the non-surgery group. 
this was 1.3% versus 2.3%, which was statistically significant. Of course, other benefits are reversing uh, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and then um, cholesterol. And all of these things are all risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And so cardiovascular disease and uh, cardiovascular deaths, events are lowered after bariatric surgery. Now let's talk about who the candidates are for bariatric surgery. So candidates include individuals with a body mass index of uh, 40 um, and higher, and they don't need to have any other comorbid illnesses. Then individuals with a BMI of 35 to 39.9 with at least one of these comorbidities is able to qualify. Then individuals with a BMI of 30 to 34.9 and one of these following um, conditions are also um, eligible. Again, like I was saying a little bit earlier, um, Asians may be eligible at lower uh, BMI cutoffs because we've seen that the cardiovascular risk and metabolic risk increases um, at lower BMIs for um, Asians. And this seems to be particularly true in Southeastern Asians and Indians. Contraindications to surgery include significant cardiac risk factors that may preclude general anesthesia, bleeding disorders, psychiatric illnesses that are not well controlled, for example. How do people prepare for surgery? So this will involve meeting with a multidisciplinary team a few weeks or months prior to getting your surgery. You'll need to see a dietitian, for example, that will explain what to eat and how much you're able to eat after surgery. Then a mental health uh, specialist to make sure that you're able to cope with stress and other factors that um, will change uh, as you have surgery. Then of course, the a medical doctor who will maybe run some tests, do some counseling, and then the bariatric surgeon who will perform um, the surgery and make sure that you're a good uh, surgical candidate. You also need to start a regular exercise program um, prior to surgery because you want to reduce a little bit of weight prior to surgery so that you can have the best chance at a good recovery. A variety of complications can occur with weight loss surgery. Obviously the risks depend on which surgery you have and which medical problems you have. Some of the most common early complications include bleeding, infection, blockages, nausea, vomiting, this sort of thing. So let's move on to talking about the surgeries. The operations cause people to lose weight by restricting the amount of food they can eat. They also change the way the intestinal hormones work and they also cause a malabsorption of food. In turn, these actions will decrease your appetite, decrease absorption of food, and increase your body's sensitivity to insulin. And so remember, even when you get these procedures done, you still need to combine them with lifestyle modification like watching what you eat. And so let's talk about the Roux and Y gastric bypass. In this surgery, most of the stomach is removed. The stomach is made into a 30 milliliter pouch. It's basically the size of a golf ball. The small intestine is divided so that 50 to 150 centimeters is off to the side. This way secretions from the rest of the stomach, liver and pancreas can still travel to help you digest food. Then the small pouch is connected to the jejunum, a part of the small intestine. And so because there's less distance for the food to pass through, there'll be less absorption of calories. So the Roux and Y gastric bypass also alters the way that your intestinal hormones function. And so after surgery, um, ghrelin hormone levels are lower and leptin levels are higher. So ghrelin signals to you that you are hungry. It is a hormone that is made by the stomach and it increases during periods of fasting. Levels of ghrelin are low after eating. Leptin is a hormone made by the fat cells in the body, known as the adipocytes, and leptin tells you that you're full. Gastric bypass has a high success rate, and people lose an average of 70 to 75% of their excess body weight in the first year. So for a person who's 120 pounds overweight, on average, they can expect to lose about 90 pounds of weight. Weight loss typically levels off at one to two years. When these people are followed out to five years, they have an overall excess weight loss between uh, 60 to 70 percent. So there is some uh, small amount of uh, weight gain that can occur. So some considerations when it comes to the Roux and Y gastric bypass. 
It treats insulin resistance better than other bariatric surgeries, so it may be preferred in patients with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, as these conditions are attributable to insulin resistance. And Roux-en-Y gastric bypass is equivalent to sleeve gastrectomy when it comes to improving diabetes in the short term. However, long-term Roux-en-Y gastric bypass is associated with better long-term control of diabetes. Individuals who have Barrett's esophagus, which is a complication of acid reflux or severe acid reflux, probably would do better with a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Obviously, the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass involves two connections, and so it can be riskier for certain individuals. Now for the sleeve gastrectomy. Sleeve gastrectomy is a partial gastrectomy in which the majority of the bigger part here, the greater curvature of the stomach is removed and a tubular stomach is created. About 90% of the stomach is removed. What's left behind is a 50 to 150 milliliter sleeve of stomach, which is kind of like a small banana um, or about 10% of what it could previously hold. There's no rerouting or manipulation of the small intestine. And so the stretchiest part of the stomach is removed and this restricts how much you can eat. The sleeve gastrectomy makes the stomach a high pressure organ, so with a sphincter at both ends. And so there's a much higher incidence of um, acid reflux because of the higher pressure. The gastrectomy, like Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, also causes some hormonal changes with decreases in uh, ghrelin levels, which promote less hunger, and um, it improves insulin resistance as well. For individuals who have the gastric sleeve, they lose an average of 60 to 65% of their excess body weight um, when followed out two years after the procedure. So for a person who is 120 pounds overweight, this means losing about 78 pounds. As with the Roux Y gastric bypass, you still need to um, follow appropriate lifestyle uh, changes as well after you have surgery. Now let's talk about the balloon procedures. There are multiple balloons, but the one that is most commonly used is Orbera, and it also seems to have the most weight loss research backing it. And so intragastric balloons, so the balloons that go into the stomach, differ in material, volume, how long you keep them in, how you put them in, how you take them out. The Orbera balloon is uh, approved for uh, treating obesity in individuals who have a BMI of 30 to 40 and who have previously failed attempts at weight loss through lifestyle changes alone. And so the American Gastroenterology Association does support the use of uh, intragastric balloon therapy when lifestyle measures alone have failed. And so like I said before, uh, from a lifestyle uh, perspective and medication perspective, people generally lose two to 9% of their total body weight. In comparison, these intragastric balloons, um, when you get them, you can expect to lose eight to 15% of your total body weight in the short term, depending on the type of balloon that's used. The weight loss with this system is highly variable. So people will lose 10 to 50 pounds. It's not as dramatic as the surgical options, obviously. It's mainly helpful for people with kind of borderline type two diabetes um, and diet and exercise is absolutely needed to achieve and maintain the goals. The balloon that's placed into the stomach is made of silicone and it's filled with 400 to 700 milliliters of saline. After sitting in the stomach for six months, it's removed uh, through the scope. There are a few long-term studies on weight loss maintenance after balloon removal. In one observational study of Greek patients, we can see that their baseline weight was 276 pounds. After the balloon was removed, they were 216 pounds. Then after uh, five years, there was an increase in weight, um, but they were still um, a bit smaller than what their baseline was at 260 pounds. Absolute contraindications to the gastric balloon therapy include gastric surgery, any bleeding or clotting disorders, desire to become pregnant, severe liver, liver disease, and those sorts of things. During the first week after you get the balloon put in, a majority of people will develop some form of gastrointestinal symptoms because your stomach needs to accommodate that balloon inside of it. 
So a combination of medications is used throughout the first week after you've had the balloon placed. And so this can really help decrease uh, the symptoms. Obviously, regaining the weight is problematic after uh, you've had the balloon taken out. And so that's why, again, having the behavior modification and lifestyle modification is uh, very important. I hope you found this video helpful and it just kind of scratches the surface to give you an idea of what types of surgeries and procedures are out there. If you think that surgery or this balloon procedure could be helpful for you, definitely talk to your doctor about it to see if you would be a candidate for uh, such a procedure. Have a great day. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you later. Bye.